Talking about specs usually boils down to one main question. Do you need a serious computer, or can you run Blender on a potato laptop from the era before Android phones? 3D is often intimidating, and it can be frustrating to think that your hardware simply can't keep up with the demands of a scene, or that you need a new $1,000 or even $3,000 PC to be able to use the software. For many students especially, that isn't necessarily an option, and for non-graphic professionals, it might seem like a wasted investment. In this video, I'm going to quickly run through what I consider good baselines for specs for those starting out in Blender. I'll go through some possibilities, tips, and tricks to help with modeling and rendering, and discuss some machines that I've used for reference. So let's dive right in. Many scientific figures are quite simple. Basic layers, simple grids, a few molecules, some cylinders shaded to look like lasers, etc, etc. As a result, a good base for Blender is any mid-range desktop or laptop made within the past five years. Significantly older models may not support Blender 2.8 or more recent versions, but high-spec machines are generally speaking not necessary. If you have an old potato of a laptop, it should probably be enough. With that said, let's discuss some options for lower spec users. First, you could install Blender on a better spec work computer. I do recommend checking with your system admins before you go ahead and do this, but it is an approach that I've used in the past. Render farms are definitely an option for completing larger projects that have tight deadlines. Although, again, this is really only for rendering, and if this is the situation you're in, then it may be time to consider a PC upgrade because you're probably modeling something impressive, or you have some serious render requirements. Finally, using a service such as Vagon to remotely use higher performing machines, this was actually recommended by Josh Gambrel, whose channel I highly recommend, is a good option. Now, hardware aside, I want to share some of the ways that I keep my scenes manageable and my render times reasonable. First, let someone else do the work. The potato, graphics card, and CPU that you saw in this presentation were all public domain models that I downloaded from BlendSwap, with the original creators credited in the description. If you're looking to save a lot of time or computer power on modeling and shading, a really good tip is to see if someone else has done it for you and generously made it freely available. Though science-specific assets aren't as common, you may get lucky, and I myself am consistently working on and releasing specialized scientific assets for free on Gumroad. And that ties nicely into the next point. Anyone who has seen some of my free asset releases knows that I like to leave certain modifiers turned off, subsurface for instance, in the file. That will help cut geometry significantly to a point where Blender actually has a simplify function in the render properties tab that will limit the max subdivisions allowed in the scene. Changing settings on other modifiers can also help. I often disable modifier visibility in edit mode and change the limit method on bevels to angle so that it cuts down geometry. I also like to use non-destructive workflows with modifiers instead of destructive ones that add geometry that you can't disable. The non-destructive workflow also tends to add a little bit more ability to edit and change, and that's something that I value. In terms of instance geometry, I prefer that. Use particles when you can do it instead of putting geometry everywhere, and that way it's also easier to hide them when you aren't working with them, making scene manipulation a lot easier. And the last thing is not necessarily complicated, but modeling in solid view without all of your lights and shaders will usually help smooth the experience. If you aren't sporting high-end hardware, I do recommend avoiding large particle systems, physics simulations, complex shaders, and sculpting. If you want to simulate water or smoke, you might be better off importing those using OpenVDB. Generate the simulation elsewhere and import to Blender to do the actual shading or rendering. This approach is actually very similar to importing chemical structures of proteins. For complex shaders, you will significantly speed up the time to create the shader if you don't use the normal or displacement. I find roughness can actually sometimes be a substitute for both of those. Also, cycles may assemble the shaders faster, but it's likely still going to take longer to render. And as for sculpting, it's not that I consider it inaccessible, it's that I generally don't use sculpting in my workflow anyway, because it's harder to teach, and I haven't had too much need for it in a serious capacity. If you do need to do it in a serious capacity, you will likely need decent hardware to keep up with the higher poly counts. For rendering, use Eevee. Eevee is generally way faster. I also like using it because you can breeze through lighting by just setting up your scene in material preview and then using the built-in HDRIs to light your scene at the end of, in the render. I'll link the tutorial for that in the description. Eevee is also generally very forgiving. In the render properties, you can cut the render samples down from 64 to 16 and it usually doesn't change too much in terms of the final quality. CPU GPU rendering is a little bit more of a discussion for cycles in my mind. There's also no two ways around it that this is a bit more of an in-depth topic and I'm not going to cover it in this video. If it is something that you're thinking about or want to get to some details on, Blender Guru has a number of extensive videos covering this subject and I would point anyone in that direction. I don't typically recommend using cycles unless you really care about shadows or glass, anything transparent or anything volumetric. 
if that is something you have to work on, then cycles is really going to be the better option. Just be prepared to deal with longer render times. I personally find that photorealism is generally very unnecessary for a lot of scientific figures, and in some ways it's actually undesirable. The last piece of advice I have here is that cheat with other programs when you can. So I'll often set up animations to complete in 3 seconds over 72 frames, and then I'll just get all the timings right between the relative parts, move the video to a different editing software, I personally use DaVinci Resolve, and then slow down the clip so that it just seems a little bit more stretched out, rather than having to render larger numbers of frames. Finally, a brief discussion on the machines that I have personally used and currently use, as well as my upgrade plans and some peripherals. I did my PhD work with a mix of a Toshiba satellite from 2009 when I started undergrad, so not quite pre-Android, which is 2008, but pretty close. That laptop was actually too old to run 2.8, and the only upgrade it ever saw was a small SSD so that the boot time for the system was less than 15 minutes, and that's not a joke. At this point, it really is on its last legs, and the fan is trying to help it achieve low Earth orbit to stay cool anytime I open Chrome. My main machine right now is actually an old 8700 Dell desktop. It's still pretty decent by many measures, and it has been used to create all the videos, free assets, and projects that I've done related to CG figures so far. It can't handle many of the higher-end things I've described, but I'll still be keeping it after I upgrade because it's entirely serviceable, and by testing tutorials and assets on it, I can really gauge if they're going to be too much for hardware that is a bit older to handle, and I understand that much of my audience or target audience is working from said hardware. I am currently working on a higher-end build, but at this point, that is a professional decision that will help me generate content, namely tutorials, assets, and production work, much faster. So that is a calculated investment, and I've been mulling it over for going on two years now. I do run everything on Windows, but I've taught people who use Macs, and they're totally fine. To quickly discuss peripherals, I use a wireless mouse and keyboard. You can see the models here. Nothing special, just functional. As long as the keyboard has a number pad, I'd say go for it. If it doesn't, there are also shortcut workarounds to that. I just happen to like the number pad. I typically also recommend a mouse with a middle mouse button. As for things like tablets, tablets I consider largely unnecessary for working in Blender unless you're going to specifically be working in something like sculpting or texture painting. And if you're doing that, then you've probably done some research already. For generic modeling and for pretty much everything that I do on the channel, you would never need a tablet, and I think that's true for a lot of regular scientific figures. Finally, you can see that I have a much older monitor. It's from 2011. It is a potato. In terms of reference or specific parts, I'm not going to endorse anything, especially for scientists on a budget. New hardware releases in the past two months alone have significantly changed the performance per dollar ratio, and I'm not the right person to provide that information. As noted, I've made every video on this channel on my existing computer, and my planned upgrades reflect a professional decision backed by over a year of research on the parts. There are plenty of hardware review channels, Linus Tech Tips, Gamers Nexus, JS2 Sense, Hardware Connects, Hardware Unbox, and Bitwit are among my favorites, and will all provide excellent and current opinions, coverage, and options. Just remember that, regardless, Blender is pretty accessible, even to somewhat dated hardware. So hopefully this has been useful, encouraged you to start Blender with your existing machine, no matter what state it's in. And if that's the case, then consider subscribing, sharing with your friends and colleagues, and until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.